So how did Qatar become a double agent in the Middle East? Since the beginning of the Gaza-Israel war, Qatar seems to be everywhere you look. On the one hand, they are mediators for the release of the Israeli hostages held by Hamas. And on the other hand, they're the largest monthly funders of Hamas and have been for many, many years. So how does Qatar manage to dance at two weddings? Qatar is an unusual country. It has a population of just 2.7 million, out of which about 12% are actually citizens, and the rest, about 2.4 million, are foreign workers. We're talking about a small Islamic nation, smaller than Connecticut. It's extremely rich in oil and natural gas, and is the country with the most millionaires in the relation to its size of population. Qatar's main goal, if you ask, is to increase its influence in the Middle East and become a global top player. Qatar has been supporting the likes of Hamas, the Muslim Brotherhood, the Taliban, Iran, and the Islamic factions in Syria and Libya for decades. Many of these have an extreme anti-Western sentiment. This is where Qatar's two-faced approach in the Middle East comes to play. To understand the story, let's zoom out to the Middle East as a whole and to the groups at play. On the one side, you have the resistance axis. This is an alliance of state and non-state actors united by their opposition to the US and the existence of Israel. These include, first and foremost, of course, the Hamas, along with Iran, Hezbollah, Syria, the Houthi movement in Yemen, and many organizations within Iraq. And on the opposite side are all of the countries that have signed peace agreements or normalization agreements with the state of Israel. Egypt, Jordan, the UAE, Bahrain, Sudan, and Morocco. These nations maintain a close relationship between the US and other Western countries in general. And many of them, of course, oppose the resistance axis we mentioned on an ideological level. But of course, many of them can't speak about that publicly because they have internal issues that would prevent them to talk honestly about this issue. So let's zoom back to Qatar. Qatar invests billions of dollars in promoting its image as a modern pro-Western country, throwing financing worldwide at education, art, culture, and everywhere that has influence and exposure even hosting events like the FIFA World Cup and the Formula One races. And with their incredible wealth, this clean and positive image could be all they need to become a top player in the global field. However, these billions of dollars do not obscure the simple fact that in many places in the Middle East, from the Persian Gulf to North Africa, the path of this money is littered with blood that leads back to Qatar. In recent years, Qatar has contributed most of the funding going into the Gaza Strip, around 20 to $30 million per month. This money is supposed to go to civil projects to improve the economy and the situation in the Gaza Strip. But given the state of Gaza and where all those funds have gone, it's difficult not to say that much of this supports terrorism. Over the years, Egypt and other Arab countries have tried to warn Israel of Qatar's involvement with the Hamas. They've had their own negative experiences with the groups such as the Hamas, like the Muslim Brotherhood, long before Israel started to deal with the effects of Hamas support of the Hamas in Gaza. To understand that, let's look into Al Jazeera, the news channel owned by Qatar and its most important arm in operation. In 2017, many Arab countries, led by Saudi Arabia and Egypt, severed diplomatic relations with Qatar and imposed a political and economic embargo on it. They claimed that Qatar, through Al Jazeera, spread hatred and encouraged extremism, terrorism and violence. Why do I say that Al Jazeera is the most important Qatari arm? Al Jazeera is one of the most watched news outlets in the Arab world. Whether you support or oppose it, the undeniable fact is that the channel has ushered in a media revolution. It maintains a strict commitment to high broadcast quality, covering events across the Middle East with on-the-ground journalists who provide live coverage. Notably, it's been unafraid to critique most of the Arab world regimes, something incredibly rare in media in the Arab world. There's only one exception, of course, Qatar's own regime. The channel maintains relationships with Sunni terrorist organizations, leading to some bizarre TV moments, like an interview with bin Laden himself after the 2001 September 11th attacks, in which, of course, bin Laden denies any connection to those attacks. Another example is its coverage of the 2011 Arab Spring protests. The channel was perceived as pouring gasoline on the protesters' fire. Their coverage incited against regimes and ultimately led to violence such as the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. In many cases, the game in which Al Jazeera has been a prominent actor sounds like this. You appeal to the impressionable young, you criticize the government, you encourage uprisings, and from there, 
the Islamic militias take control and have an easier route to overthrowing relatively moderate regimes and installing extremist Islamic regimes in their place. So why do we say double agent? From the beginning of this Israel-Hamas war, Qatar has been critical of Israel and publicly declared it to be solely responsible for what happened on October 7th. As the death toll in Gaza rose, Qatar's leaders began to popularize false accusations of war crimes and genocide that Israel was allegedly committing. On the other hand, from the first few days following the Hamas massacre, Qatari officials proclaimed they would be involved in mediation attempts between the parties in an effort to bring about the release of Israeli hostages and calm the tensions. One benefit Qatar might gain from mediating the ceasefire and hostage releases, again, its status in the world as a modern pro-West country, a key factor in its financial influence in the world. The October 7th massacre has reflected badly on Qatar, with its well-documented ties to Hamas. Mediating the deal wins Qatar many praises from the West. They are now directly linked to the hostage release, the ceasefire, and the humanitarian aid reaching Gaza. Even Israeli officials publicly thank Qatar for its part in the deal. Do you remember that FIFA World Cup we mentioned before? Let's go back to that quickly. The excitement in the West was palpable. It was undeniably thrilling, but soon enough, the dark truth was revealed. Qatari officials used bribes more than a billion dollars at a time to some voters to secure the 2022 World Cup hosting rights, followed by an FBI investigation. Indictments were filed against six of the voters, with the most senior being the vice president of FIFA. No less disturbing, of course, was Qatar's poor treatment of migrant workers that built the incredibly lavish infrastructure for these games. A sickness which plagues Qatar in almost every industry. This is the perfect example of Qatar using its endless richness to mask its true face and win points in the easily manipulated public opinion of the West. So is Qatar's involvement in the Israel-Hamas ceasefire another bear hug? Another attempt to whitewash its support of anti-Western terrorists and regimes? We in the West should be very cautious. Yes, take the gifts Qatar is presenting us in the form of hostage return because we value life and liberty and will do everything in our power to free innocent people from Hamas's heinous hands. But be alert, Qatar is not our friend. They are not an ally to the West. This is a dangerous and powerful entity with extreme Islamic ideologies and an unimaginably long financial overreach. The United States, Israel, and the rest of the freedom-seeking countries need to keep the goals of this war in mind countering the vigilant attempts of the Qatar-Iran axis to divert us. The objective is to return all hostages and destroy Hamas for the safety of Israel, Gazans, and the Western world.